Welcome to everyone joining us for our worship this morning. These last 15 months have been difficult and even heartbreaking for many people. But can you imagine if this had happened, this pandemic had happened just 15 or 20 years ago without the benefits of FaceTime, Zoom and all the other technologies which have helped us to come together with our families and as a church family to worship God. And not just folks here in our local parish, but we've been joined by folk far and wide across the UK and across the world. And welcome to all our brothers and sisters in Christ. And thank God for the benefits of technology. I sometimes struggle with the Old Testament lectionary readings and today's was no exception. Today's Old Testament tells that familiar story of David and Goliath. As I read it during the week, I thought if this was a television programme, it would probably have to come with one of those warnings saying, this programme contains scenes of violence and may be disturbing. In particular, if you were to read on beyond our reading today to verse 51. Look it up. However, the more I reflected on it, the more some of it spoke to me. So we will hear it this morning. And I'd like to thank Peter Wood, who's a speaker, was a speaker on a course that I'm doing just now for this morning's prayer. This, our opening prayer. So let's come together and worship God. Let's pray. God, you have gathered us in this place, wherever we are, at this time, to be your church. May all that we do and are build your kingdom. Amen.
The first reading is 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32. David said to Saul, Your Majesty, no one should be afraid of this Philistine. I will go and fight him. No, answered Saul. How could you fight him? You are just a boy, and he has been a soldier all his life. Your Majesty, David said, I take care of my father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear carries off a lamb, I go after it, attack it, and rescue the lamb. And if the lion or bear turns on me, I grab it by the throat and beat it to death. I have killed lions and bears, and I will do the same to this heathen Philistine who has defied the army of the living God. The Lord has saved me from lions and bears. He will save me from this Philistine. All right, Saul answered. Go, and the Lord be with you. He gave his own armour to David for him to wear, a bronze helmet, which he put on David's head, and a coat of armour. David strapped Saul's sword over the armour and tried to walk, but he couldn't because he wasn't used to wearing them. I can't fight with all this, he said to Saul. I'm not used to it. So he took it all off. He took his shepherd's stick and then picked up five smooth stones from the stream and put them in his bag. With his catapult ready, he went out to meet Goliath. The Philistine started walking towards David with his shield-bearer walking in front of him. He kept coming closer, and when he got a good look at David, he was filled with scorn for him because he was just a nice, good-looking boy. He said to David, What's that stick for? Do you think I'm a dog? And he called down curses from his God on David. Come on, he challenged David, and I will give your body to the birds and animals to eat. David answered, You are coming against me with sword, spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the Israelite armies, which you have defied. This very day, the Lord will put you in my power. I will defeat you and cut off your head, and I will give the bodies of the Philistine soldiers to the birds and animals to eat. Then the whole world will know that Israel has a God, and everyone here will see that the Lord does not need swords or spears to save his people. He is victorious in battle, and he will put all of you in our power. Goliath started walking towards David again, and David ran quickly towards the Philistine battle line to fight him. He put his hand into his bag and took out a stone which he slung at Goliath. It hit him on the forehead and broke his skull and Goliath fell face downwards on the ground. And the second reading is Mark chapter 4 verse 35. Jesus calms a storm. On the evening of that same day, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they left the crowd. The disciples got into the boat in which Jesus was already sitting and they took and they took him with them other boats were there too suddenly a strong wind blew up 
and the waves began to spill over into the boat, so that was about to fill with water. Jesus was in the back of the boat, sleeping with his head on a pillow. The disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care that we are about to die? Jesus stood up and commanded the wind, Be quiet. And he said to the waves, Be still. The wind died down and there was a great calm. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Why are you frightened? Have you still no faith? But they were terribly afraid and said to one another, Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Amen. Jesus and the disciples all went to sea in a plain, simple fishing boat. The lake was quite calm. Jesus said with a yawn, oh, I'm off for a nap while we float. Jesus and the disciples are all out at sea on a plain, simple wooden boat. A wild storm came. The wind was insane and the waves crashed right over the boat. Jesus is sleeping down below deck of the old Galilean boat. The disciples came down. Lord, please save us, we'll drown. Not if Jesus can stop it, you won't. Jesus is speaking and telling them straight as they tremble and shake on the boat. Why do you fear? Has your faith disappeared? And he heads up on deck with his coat. Jesus is standing up on the deck of the first century sailing boat. He says, peace be still. And everything chills. Wind and waves obeyed when Jesus spoke. Jesus and the disciples all went to sea in a plain, simple wooden boat. Total calm is maintained and the men are amazed. Here's what they said and I'll quote. Who is this man? I don't understand. Wind and waves will obey, just his voice? He's the king of the world. Through him, God's plan unfurls, and he's with us, so we can rejoice. Jesus is with his disciples, wherever they go, on foot, in a car, or by boat. With him, they're quite safe, even with childlike faith. It's enough to bring a lump your throat.
Goliath is such a familiar story that we sometimes miss some of the subtleties within it. It's easy to presume David is the underdog. He is tiny in comparison to the giant Goliath. He seems to have little in the way of weaponry compared to Goliath, and he has no armour for protection. However, David has explained to Saul how he protected his sheep. Some of it might seem a slightly exaggerated. I don't know. But David had great skill with a sling. There is no doubt of that. But we mustn't mistake this sling for a catapult. It was quite different. It would be spun around David's head and when the stone was released, there was real power behind it. And David had used this often to kill predators when he was looking after his sheep. So if we reconsider this story, recognise that we have a heavily armoured but lumbering giant who needs to fight close up to gain success against a quick and agile young man with a weapon which is deadly at a distance. Really, who was the underdog? But this story can still speak to church today. Goliath can be seen as our church, perhaps. It has become large and heavily burdened. And perhaps just that phrase makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable. What are these burdens? Take a moment. In honesty, can you identify some of the burdens of our church today? Maybe if you're listening to this at home with another family member or a friend, you might even stop the video for a minute and think about what are the burdens? Have you been able to identify any? Well, let's think about that armour worn in battle by Goliath. He could hardly move. He even needed a shield bearer. Saul gave his armour to David because warriors needed armour. But had he seen David? He was tiny. I can remember many years ago, my mum taking me to get a winter outfit which would be my Christmas present. Now, this might come as a shock to some younger folks there, but when I was 13, I didn't really have much say in the clothes that I wore. So my mum bought for me a very smart, green, fitted tweed suit. She loved it. It was ghastly. Then, to make matters worse, I had to get good shoes to go with it. Now, initially, I was quite excited. She said I could get a pair of high heels. Well, I did get a pair of brown leather court shoes. My mum or my gran would have looked really good in that suit and those shoes. My mum had dressed me in something she would wear, not something a 13-year-old would wear. Like Saul's armour on David, it was wasted on me. And too many of us are tied to the way things have always been done in the church. We have so many traditions and rituals. And interestingly, many of those traditions and rituals would have started out as being something new and innovative a long time ago. So then someone like David comes along and challenges us with new ideas. Well, our church, our church which is burdened with these traditions and rituals and buildings, well, those ideas die because we're too slow. We're too slow to work out how they will fit 
with the way we do things. People often say, we just need a good leader. And the truth is, many of us, many churches, already have the leaders that we need. But maybe we don't have the leaders that we want. And leadership isn't just about our minister or one person in a group. Jesus didn't do things by himself. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out the 72 in pairs and he said to them, go, go like lambs among wolves, heal the sick. He didn't say, let's all go to the synagogue and wait till the people come to us. He preached outdoors. Well, okay, maybe the weather was better there. But he didn't need a special building. He went out and he met the people where they were. We are not going to bring the good news of God's love to people sitting in a church every Sunday morning. And the sad thing, well for me, is that there are lots of people out there who are looking for something to fill that God space in their lives. But the last place they would ever go to is our church. Our church today was very relevant to people and the culture a hundred years ago. But the world has changed, yet the church is still very like it was a hundred years ago. I don't have the answers, but unless we seriously begin looking for those answers or new ways of being the church, I suspect there is not much future for us, for our church. Well, obviously, I can't leave it there, all doom and gloom. When I was training for the readership, I was told, always share the good news. And thankfully, there is good news. But like David, like the disciples in the boat, we must trust God. We need to open ourselves to listen to the Spirit and we need to be willing to do things differently. We need to be brave. We don't need to leave anyone behind. So often people worry that we might upset the old folk if we do things differently or suggest change. But more often than not, certainly the old people I have known who have a close relationship with God are as eager for change as any one of us. I ask you, think about this, pray about it. If you feel moved to suggest trying something new, don't worry, don't be scared. Talk to someone. Share your ideas. Email Willem. Email Alison, the session clerk, or Marion. Email anyone whose address is on the printout and ask them to raise it in the Kirk session. And if nothing happens, raise it again. Talk to folks at church. Then bring it to the congregation. We need to be a church that is open and listening. We need to share our ideas and become the church that God has planned. Let's not rush on to the next part of the service. Let's pause and just think about our readings and our response. A brief reflection. Deceivingly small, 
terrifyingly effective. The peril of the highlands, the wee midgey. Culicoides impunctatus, almost unseen. Dancing beyond our swats, immune to our taunts. Finding a way between clothes, no armour they, sapping life and energy in order to create life anew. So small, so fearsome. What lessons can we learn from persistent midgey or unassuming shepherd boy? When do we need to stir the giants and face the obstacles? Deploy the resources to hand in love and grace to see the insurmountable overcome, the self-satisfied humbled and the violent stilled. there
Let us pray. God of the universe, we gather together. We join together our hearts and minds to praise and worship you. We know what you have created is awesome. Awesome in the sense of filling us with wonder and amazement. Each day, more discoveries are made about our universe the universe created by you. Yet sometimes we fail to notice that incredible creation. We ask you, God, open our eyes, open all our senses, so that we can truly appreciate all that you have done. And then we will praise you without prompting and worship you in complete sincerity because it will be so clear and obvious that you are worthy of our praise. And now we praise and worship you. Merciful God, we are not always open to your guiding, not always aware of the needs you show us. It can be too easy to say the problem is too big for one person. Too easy to see an unbeatable giant. We forget you don't ask us to solve challenges on our own. Help us to remember the words of Paul. By your power, we can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Forgive us that too often we limit your power by the smallness of our own minds. Knowing we are forgiven, strengthen us, give us your vision and lead us forward. Compassionate God, as we consider this familiar story of David and the giant, may we gain new insight to your world today. We bring before you our concerns. We think of those caught up in war, lands devastated by war and damaged by climate change. We remember the families who are homeless, those traumatised by their involvement in war, by abuse, neglect and hunger. Today we pray you will guide our leaders in their policies for refugees. We pray that our treatment of refugees will not add further trauma. Rather, it will demonstrate love and compassion. We pray for those in our own communities, the lonely, the sick, the hungry, the frightened, And we remember our own minister, Willem, and Hazel, and the children. We hold them, God, and ask you to bless them in all they do. Help us to see those who need our help. Help us to be people who will love and serve. And to know when we are the answer to our prayers. We thank you, God. Thank you for all that is good in our lives. Thank you that you are with us when life is tough. And we thank you for the people you put in our lives to support us when we struggle in life. And thank you that even when we feel lost and alone, you are always there. 
Lord, we come to you now in silence and we share with you those things, those thoughts and people for which we are grateful. Lord, hear our prayer. And in the words that Jesus taught, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and all whom we love, now and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.